Um, hello and welcome to our second equity, diversity and belonging perspective into incident reporting workshop with my good colleague, Simone Welsh. So I'm Kevin Dave, my pronouns are he, him, and I am RCOT's equity, diversity and belonging lead. Um, and also from the RCOT uh, team, I have Chanel Shockness, uh, who's our events officer. So bear with me, I've got a bit of a throat. <clears throat> Before we start this workshop, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we have enabled live transcription for this event. So if you would like to see the captions on your Zoom controls, click uh, live transcript and select show subtitle. You can use the chat feature throughout and there will be a discussion at the end. Um, and if for any reason the meeting ends suddenly, please wait a few moments um, and then rejoin using the same link. And you're welcome to have your camera on, but please, um, mute yourself unless you are currently talking so i'm well we're really delighted that simone Walsh will be presenting and leading this workshop today um simone is a senior specialist occupational therapist in stroke at imperial college healthcare nhs trust uh so i think without any further delay it gives me great pleasure to hand you over to simone thanks get Hi everyone, um, as mentioned before, my name's Simone, I'm one of the occupational therapists at Imperial. Um, I also have my colleague Amma today, who will be helping with um, some of the admin of this session. Um, so just a little bit of background today, we'll be speaking about an EDB perspective into incident reporting. Um, so we also have a Slido, so it is an interactive workshop. So just to kind of start and get ourselves familiar with Slido, I'd like everyone to log on to www.slido.com um, and then it will ask for a code. And the code for the first kind of questions um, that we'll be asking today is 2536631. Two, that's 2536631. And we'd just like to get a little bit of an idea of who's in the room with us today. So sort of where people are working um, and what kind of um, diverse group we have in the session today. So um, please log on um, and do answer the first initial polls. And then we will kind of move on to what the content of today's workshop will be about. So as you can see, there's two polls, um, one about kind of what area you're working in and any kind of protected characteristics that you might identify as. Um, I do believe for the protected characteristics, you can select more than one if you feel that more than one is applicable to yourself. So do sign on and do um, use the code to answer. It's really good to see that um, people are interacting. We'll just give you a few more moments um, to try and log on. Um, I might also see if I can, I'll just type the code in the chat as well. So I'll say poll one is 2536631. And you, if it's easier, you can always copy and paste um, the code from the chat box as well. Um, so when we're talking about age, it's whether you feel that you are in a protected group as a result of your age. So we will speak about this a bit later, but we know that the Equality Act um, does put age as a protected characteristic. So if you feel that um, you may be at risk because of your age in relation to the rest of your team, um, please put that down. Okay, great. So you can all kind of keep sort of recording your polls and we we'll just switch back to the presentation screen and we kind of talk about what it is we're going to be doing today. So the session outline um, is we're going to be speaking about some of the supporting theories that relate to how some people from different protected characteristics might influence on how they experience discrimination. 
We'll also look at the national statistics. Again, we're very interactive, so we're going to do a case study discussion today utilising the Slido function so people can um, report how they feel about this topic anonymously. And we'll then be thinking about developing our own per um, no worries if you're having problems signing into Slido. I'll just put the link in hit in the chat as well, and um, just for anyone who wants to um, log on or might be having some difficulties. I'm also happy for people to select answers in the chat function as well, and I will be keeping an eye on that um, also. So just going back to the outline of the session, um, we will be thinking about developing our own toolbox and so signposting resources so co-producing what we would like to put forward to the Royal College of Occupational Therapy um, to sort of develop some resources that as members we could use to, to increase our confidence with um, EDB incidences within the workplace and there will also be some signposting on existing resources that are available. So next slide. Um, no worries if you're late, so please join in. Just a reminder that these sessions will be recorded and uploaded to the website later. So um, they will be available at a later date for people to reflect back, back on, but we have just started. So thinking about the aims of the session, um, we want to understand the importance of EBD incident reporting to support cultural change, to improve our confidence in actually taking actions of EDB incident reporting within the workplace, and to, as I mentioned before, to contribute to the co-production of wellbeing strategies that we can put forward to the Royal College of Occupational Therapy. Um, so we're just going to start on some um, background theories. So the first theory we're going to think about is there's a lot of terms that I feel float around and they're not always clear what these terms mean or how they relate to each other. Um, I did have someone tweet me actually to say, you know, it says EDI and it says EBD. Are they the same thing? Are they different? Well, one of the most important first slides is to maybe define what we're talking about when we just talk about EDI and EDB. So EDI stands for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. And as a concept, it ensures fair treatment and equality of opportunities for all. It aims to eradicate prejudice and discrimination on the basis of an individual or group of individuals protected characteristics. So if we think about what an EDI incident would be, it would breach this concept. So it would mean it was an action that actively discriminated against someone on the basis of their or the group of individuals protected characteristics. And in most places of work and universities, um, there's often core values that the organisation wants to promote. And this would obviously um, breach the concept of the values of your workplace as well. Now, EDI, I think, was quite an original term that was used, but as we move forward with research and understanding in this area, we kind of reflect and maybe expand and develop on the language and terms that we use. So you have EDI, which has kind of transitioned a bit more um, into EDB. So if we look and break down each of the different words and where the subtle differences are, in EDI, it talks about equality, whereas EDB speaks more about equity. Now, originally, I think there was a lot of push to have equality of opportunities. So there was a thought about giving everyone the same opportunities to increase fairness. But if we give everyone the exact same opportunities, this still um, supports discrimination of certain groups of people because it doesn't take into con um, consideration the starting point. So if, as you can see how things have transitioned, we then move into equity. So when we're thinking about equity of opportunity, it's not necessarily about giving everyone the same opportunity, but actually thinking about how we can break down those barriers that 
that prejudices and discriminates against certain groups of people. So how can we remove the barriers so everyone can have um, an equal opportunity for access? Diversity is the same. So when we think about diversity, we want to think about a diverse group of people and looking at the diversity of thought. So it's not just about necessarily just having a diverse group of people on the basis of their race, but it can be thinking about diversity on many different sort of levels. So people's gender, their age, their sexual orientation, their identity, their thought process, and lots of theories and research do support that where you have an increase in diversity of a group, there is increase in creativity and productivity at the end. Now, what the research does suggest is that Whilst a more diverse group might take longer to have a better cohesion together, actually at the end, their output is far greater because it eradicates that group think. So every and confirmation bias of everyone disagreeing with everyone um, because we all kind of think in the same way. And then we think about inclusion and belonging. So when we think about inclusivity, um, we're wanting obviously everyone to be included in um, a space or an environment. So for example, we're talking a lot about the workplace here. So making sure that we're setting up um, structures in place where everyone can engage. But actually, again, think about taking that a step further is how can we make few people feel not only included, but they belong in the places that they work in. So if we move on to the next slide, um, we're thinking a bit about the Equality Act when we talk about um, these protected characteristics. So the Equality Act of 2010 outlines that people should not be discriminated or prejudiced against on the basis of their age. So if we think about different scenarios, so for example, applying for a job, for example, um, they shouldn't be sort of turned down for a job because um, you know, they're of a certain age that might be entering, say, for example, retirement. But also um, what often does happen is people can also be discriminated because they're a little bit younger. So a lot of jobs might say, oh, you can't apply unless you have five years experience. But for someone who might be slightly younger, they might have the skills and opportunities to be successful in that role. But they're discriminated because they might not have kind of been um, sort of able to have that five years experience um, exactly. Another one is thinking about disability. So not just physical disability, but all of the other hidden disabilities as well. Um, gender reassignment, their race, religion or belief, their sex gender. So thinking about biological sex as well, sexual orientation, um, whether they're pregnant or on maternity leave, um, or married or in civil partnerships. And I always think it wasn't that long ago in the last hundred years where women um, had to give up their jobs because they got married. Um, I know that happened to my great grandmother. So um, within our sort of generations that has changed and we have moved forward in that sense. So we move on to the next slide. Um, so if we think about all those concepts together, and we can really see how EDB can really tie into our theories as occupational therapists and how the actions that we can do to promote equality, diversity and belonging can support and promote occupational performance and participation. Where we are in situations where we are not supporting people um, or we're actively discriminating against that, that has a large impact on um, their performance in their occupations or their opportunity for occupational engagement. And what we can think, and when we think about these concepts is when we think about the person and the protected characteristics, this is not necessarily something that they should have to change, but it's something that they are, it's part of who they are but it's often the environment and not the physical environment or the social environment that is creating the barriers to them being able to have equitable um, opportunity for occupational performance and participation. 
Um, so we're going to go back on to Slido again. So I'll just write it in the chat. So if we go back onto www.slido.com and we're going to go to poll number two. And this one is asking you about your own personal um, confidence um, with identifying and reporting EDI um, incidences. So the next poll is... 3828016. So I have put those um, codes in the chat as well if it's easier for you to copy and paste. And the first two questions ask How confident do you feel in identifying an EDB incident? And then the second question, so if you if you finish the first question, you can move on to the second question, with, which is the same code, is how confident do you feel in reporting an EDB incident? So we have um, made the poll active now. So do think about sort of the difference in how you feel with identifying compared to reporting. So if we go back to the first poll on identifying, we can see that on average, um, people scored sort of 3.1 in identifying. So, you know, that's quite um, usual when we've done these kind of polls, people um, generally feel okay about identifying um, these types of incidences. And um, what I do say is though, a lot of people maybe not even realizing maybe the breadth of incidences that might occur. So when things are very explicit, it can be quite obvious, but when things are a little bit more subtle, it can sometimes be harder to identify. And in a very usual pattern, it can feel actually a little bit more uncertain on actually what are our responsibilities and what can we do if we witness or experience an EDB incident, particularly within the workplace. Okay, so we'll just move back. So keep filling out the polls. I put the poll codes um, in the chat. So um, if you do come slightly later, all the information is in the chat as well. Um, so we're now going to think a little bit about um, some of the supporting theories as to what can promote acts of discrimination and prejudice. Um, so one of the things that I think is important to think about is unconscious bias and the roles this plays in how we formulate our thoughts and opinions of others. So we're going to play this really lovely short video that just explains a little bit about unconscious bias. Um, if you can't hear, please just write in the chat and we'll fix it. The unconscious mind is amazing. It can process vastly more information than our conscious mind by using shortcuts based on our background, cultural environment, and personal experiences to make almost instantaneous decisions about everything around us. The snag is, it's wrong quite a lot of the time, especially on matters that need rational thinking. Here's a classic example. A bat and a ball cost one pound ten pence. If the bat costs one pound more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? Most people, including over 50% of students at some of the world's leading universities, get the answer wrong and say ten pence. The answer is actually five pence. Many of us choose ten pence without thinking. This is because our unconscious mind uses instinct, not analysis. So our unconscious is fallible. It's also biased. It makes snap judgments of people we meet, categorizing them according to gender, social and other characteristics. In milliseconds, we judge whether somebody is like us and belongs to our in-group. These are the people we favor. So men might favour men, while women might favour women. However, we can belong to different in-groups, and we like to be part of an in-group that's powerful, which could mean a woman favouring a man over a woman. That's unconscious bias, 
All of us have it, and it colours our decisions without our realising. For example, research reveals that if I were a man, you would be more likely to be nodding in agreement right now because people pay more attention to a male voice. The Royal Society fosters excellence in science, but this can only be achieved if we select from the widest range of talent. And that's not possible if unconscious bias is narrowing down the field for non-scientific reasons. To lessen the impact of unconscious bias, which is easier for us to notice in others, we are raising the awareness of unconscious bias to members of our selection and appointment panels. We're encouraging panel members to deliberately slow down decision making, reconsider reasons for decisions, question cultural stereotypes, and monitor each other for unconscious bias. We can't cure unconscious bias, but with self awareness, we can address it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, great. So um, that was one of the first videos we wanted to show. Um, so just getting us reflect on how our unconscious bias can really affect how we see other people and make maybe important de decisions that might actually actively discriminate against someone because maybe they have, um, they're quite different to us. Um, there is another video we wanted to show before we move on. And as I was mentioning before, um, a lot of people feel very confident about identifying when there is an EDB incident that is quite explicit. So if explicit language is used or an explicit action um, is used, um, it can feel a bit more easier to identify. But what we actually need to recognise is a lot of incidences that occur aren't very explicit. They're a little bit more subtle in nature. And if we think about the history of people who experience protected characteristics and what they've gone through in the past, and not only in the past of history, but in the past of their life experiences, actually what we find is a lot of the experiences they have might be more subtle. So something we might label as a microaggression. And these subtle comments or actions actually happen on a more frequent basis and can actually have a very large effect on someone's confidence or how they're feeling. And especially if we're thinking about that EDB and that belonging, it can really have a big impact on how that person feels in terms of belonging to a group as well. So this is a fantastic resource that was created by the CSP. Um, and it just really kind of highlights the importance of calling out and being conscious about not contributing to microaggressions. Where are you from, originally? I get asked this all the time. And after 16 years of living here, I still don't feel I belong. You try to ignore it but it can still drag you down. Microaggressions are when we show subtle negative attitudes, discrimination or hostility towards a member of a marginalised group. The thing about microaggressions is, you may not have meant it, but it still makes the other person feel belittled. Can you let me know who the decision maker is? I get subtle questions about my authority, because I am black. You may not have noticed it, but it still shatters the other person's confidence. I can't pronounce your name, it's too difficult. I say it phonetically, but often they can't be bothered to try. The scale of the problem is huge, and at the moment, we are only just chipping away at it. We all have a role to play. Call out microaggressions. Educate. Challenge. Support. Get started at csp.org.uk slash microaggressions.
Okay, so that was just explaining that whilst we think of discrimination as very explicit acts, actually the act of microaggression is actively discriminating against someone of a marginalised group. And this often happens in the workplace and it can happen between um, staff and patients or patients to staff or even between staff members um, in the workplace. So when we think about microaggressions, it might be something like making a racist joke, but someone saying that they're aware the joke is racist, but it's harmless, it's fine, it's just a joke. But that can actually have a big impact on how someone's feeling, their confidence, and actually it's just not a very nice thing to say either. It also might, you might have heard um, someone insinuating that, you know, oh, that person only got the job to fill a quota. So demeaning the person's skills and um, successes and just insinuating that, oh, it's just because they're black that they got the job or just because of whatever other protected characteristics. And also invalidations. And again, when we're thinking about discrimination and how this can impact on belonging, a lot of what is said is things like, you know, where are you really from? And whilst I always say it's good to talk to people and be inquisitive about their heritage and their background and who they are, when I always say with microaggressions, like if you wrote it down on paper, it doesn't always look that bad, but actually it's sometimes in the intonation that someone doesn't belong or you're not really from here. And I always give a personal example of something that had happened to me. So I was at work one day, I was just walking down the corridor with one of my colleagues. So I, you know, I have a Jamaican background, but I was born in this country. Even my father, who has a Jamaican background, was born in this country as well. I grew up here all my life. And as I walked down the corridor, um, I had a patient say as I passed them, but where are all the English workers? So because my skin is not white, and I, although I was born in this country and grew up, grew up in this country and identify as British, those kind of comments are saying, but I don't belong to the UK because my skin is not white. So those are the type of microaggressions that do happen on a daily basis. And it's important to see them or value them as important as things that are said a little bit more explicitly. Um, so then moving forward about what we can do about this, um, anyone who went to the RCOT conference in 2021, there was a great um, talk by Yvonne Coghill, and actually, how can we be authentic allies? So what can we do? What actions can we take um, in ourselves to try and support a cultural change around um, EDI instances that might occur in the workplace, but also maybe outside of the workplace as well. So I thought this just was a really great concept and I love to share this with people and thinking about having the appetite for it. So having that kind of appetite that you feel that it's important, you want to um, promote cultural change, you want to improve that inclusivity and belonging and diversity as a group. Thinking about asking questions, but again, thinking about all those active actions. So, you know, there's so many resources available today, you know, social media, there's internet, there's Google, you know, if you prefer, there's even the library and lots of books if you're someone who prefers something a bit more physical. And thinking about how you can actively seek answers and then go into someone with a more dynamic conversation about a question you have. So not just relying on the person of the protected characteristic to give you all the answers, but maybe doing some research and then asking questions on the basis of your research as well. Um, accepting that there's a problem. So we all have privileges. Um, although I'm you know, from a black and minority ethnic background, I do identify as um, someone who is heterosexual, which might give me a preference in some communities. So although there's, you know, there might be 
discrimination in the black community there's also discrimination in all other communities of protected characteristics as well so it's thinking about accepting that other people's experiences might be different from our own and what we've own personally experienced so just because it might not happen to you or you might not have necessarily seen it it's not to say that it's not happening and that moves on to acknowledging. So acknowledging what is happening and acknowledging that's the problem, that there's a problem. We also want to think about apologizing. So as we saw in the unconscious bias video, you know, unconscious bias happens to all of us. No, none of us are bigger or better than unconscious bias. And we all make mistakes or say something that we didn't mean to come across in a certain way. But if it's having a negative impact on someone, it's just about apologizing and really kind of thinking about what we said and making those active actions um, to kind of not make the same mistake again. Um, and they're not making assumptions about someone. So if we're unsure, I guess it kind of links back to asking again. Um, and then my favorite one is taking action. So actually doing um, practical steps in the fight to, or the journey to sort of change the cultural background. And that's what this workshop is all about. It's about how can we take action to improve the culture around EDI incident reporting? And why is this important? So I've just given um, some, um, just a few demographics to kind of highlight why this topic is important. So as a workforce, we're hugely diverse. So I got some um, HCPC demographic information um, on occupational therapists. And as a group, um, compared to other professionals, um, on average, people tend to be around the age of 42 years old. Um, from a gender, there is a high proportion of women compared to men, and particularly more women in occupational therapy professions compared to other backgrounds. 11% um, identified um, as having a disability. 43% were carers to someone else. 4% identified as um, having uh, being part of LG. LGBTQAI plus communities um, and 11% um, identify as being part of the black and minority ethnic um, background compared to 87% who identify as white and in comparison to other professionals um, it's slightly lower so in other professionals there's an average of 17 and percent of people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds as well so it's just to say that Within our profession and also within other professions, we're a very diverse group of people. Um, and so that's why it can really highlight that everyone is having um, a different experience and it's good to kind of be open and understand um, the experiences of other people who might be different from us. Um, if we look at this on a bit of a bigger um, sort of scale, there is the workforce race equality standards and um, so this looks at the experiences of staff within the NHS and it compares um, staff from black and minority ethnic groups um, to staff who identify as white groups and if you look at the data um, what it does show um, is that there is a higher percentage of staff um, who are experiencing um, bullying and harassment in the last 12 months from other staff members and this is happening more frequently for staff members who are um, from black and minority ethnic backgrounds although it doesn't only exclusively affect them it's just more likely to happen um, to people in those protected characteristics um, what the workforce race equality standards has suggested that things are improving so things are changing and um, so if we think about um, the likelihood of black and minority ethnic staff entering um, higher positions within the NHS that historically there was a large workforce at much lower bandings and there are been steps that made to make sure that sort of top positions have got that increase in diversity as well. So it's just saying that kind of the data is there and showing the trends that are happening, but again, highlighting that people from different protected um, characteristics are having different experiences compared to each other. 
And actually it fits really nicely in with this workshop because this is all about formal incident reporting. And we'll speak a little bit later on why this isn't so important, not only to cultural change, but also to the statistics that are put out there. Okay. So we're gonna go on to a bit of a um, case study scenario. Um, I just like to always start this discussion with a bit of a caveat. Um, it's just a caveat that these are real life scenarios that do happen um, to people. So it's something that has been reported to myself. Um, and so it's not a fake kind of scenario that has been made up for dramatic effect. Um, it, it is a real life scenario. So if we just go back onto the scenario, do the new one, should I? And we'll just keep this page on. Okay, all right, sorry. So I'm going to copy and paste the scenario into the chat for those who'd like to read it. But I'm going to read it out to all of you guys as well. So the scenario is you are supporting with a discharge plan for one of your patients who has a cognitive impairment. Um, in discussion with the patient's son, he mentions the following to you. And this, like I said, this is a real quote that a patient's son had said. So they said, I am happy for social services carers to support my mother, but we cannot accept black carers into our home as previously my mother had been attacked by a black person. So thinking about this scenario and also logging on to www.slido.com. I'm going to post the poll number three here. So the number is 6505280. And I'll just read the scenario again. Um, you are supporting with a discharge plan for one of your patients who has a cognitive impairment. In discussion with the patient's son, he mentions the following comment to you. I'm happy for social services carers to support my mother, but we cannot accept black carers into our home as previously my mother had been attacked by a black person. And I will say, I will confess, this is a scenario that actually happened to me. So I can give you more anonymous details about the scenario if you have any questions later. But let's think about if someone said that to you or if you overheard someone saying that to someone else, how would it make you feel? So a lot of people saying uncomfortable, done. I'm no longer wanting anything to do with this family. I'd be fully upset. Terrible, like a kick in the gut. Imagine being able to throw away a whole group of people and action of one person from that group. Appalled, disgusted, uncomfortable. The person sees black people as all the same. Would they say it about white carers? Hurt. Someone else has heard this as well. Infuriated. So a lot of those unsurprised I'm it, unfortunately it, it can be sometimes unsurprising that these situations happen crazy that this is such generalized to this extent so <clears throat> it's very common to feel uncomfortable um concerned angry when someone says this, or if you even overhear, I, I can really feel people's anger, even when um, I've just said this to you and you've heard it as a very third party way. Um, but yes, all of those emotions. Is it on the same slide? Uh, the next one. Yeah. So then now we think, once we've heard this comment, what action, if that was said to you, or if you heard, overheard someone saying that to someone else, what action would you take? And thinking about those who might struggle, what would the barriers to action be? So not only what action would you take, thinking about what might prevent you from taking any action as well. So barriers to action are on the third question and actions are on the second. So we've now moved on to what actions, please comment on what actions you would take first. Uh, 
Um, so I think this is the part where um, Chanel might un sort of pause the recording of this. So thank you all for such a great interactive case study discussion. Um, we'll just go back to um, a little bit more of um, some of the theory. So um, we've got key messages that when I initially started these workshops, I sent out um, a questionnaire to all allied health professionals in my trust to understand what was the culture within the trust that I worked with. And quite similar to what um, people have been saying today is most people feel shocked and saddened when they hear similar types of scenarios. People's first action is that they want to educate, they want to challenge, but we also need to be mindful that we want to support the well-being and we need to think about formally reporting these types of incidences. When I asked um, the group of AHPs within my trust what types of EDI incidences that they had experienced or witnessed, the highest percentage were to do with race, so 56% reported that the incidences that they had witnessed or experienced were about race. But more interesting, 25% reported that they never witnessed or experienced any type of EDI incidences. And again, one part of this workshop is to maybe open our minds and provide education on the range of instances that might happen in the workplace, because they're not always explicit. They might come in the form of more of a microaggression. And most importantly, why we do this workshop is when we asked them previously um, how they reported these types of instances, 50% of staff, and since I did this survey, I've done a lot more workshops and it's quite similar, um, you know, unsurprisingly or surprisingly that most people when they witness or experience an incident, the first thing they do is just talk amongst themselves, talk amongst their colleagues, talk amongst their friends. 35%, so slightly less who are witnessing or experiencing, actually escalate this to a senior manager. So it is about thinking about that culture of how can our managers make support the team to feel more comfortable and champion people feeling comfortable to speak up and formally report these instances. 14% actually did nothing, and only 8% formally completed this as a day text. So if we go through to the next slide. Now we think, well, why does it matter if someone detects something or doesn't detect something? So there's several reasons why we are promoting that these instances are reported through the Daytex system. And that's because if we think about all the data that's shared, all of the res reports, all of the data our individual institutions are taking in about incidences that are happening. Although even in the res data, they're showing that there is a difference. They're only reporting on the incidences that have been reported. And what we know more anecdotally is that more incidences are happening than are being reported. So we don't really understand the breadth and the frequency and the depth of the problem we're having with EDI instances within the workplace because not enough people are reporting it. And if we continue to report them more, what we might find is it would really support and provide the evidence for the people at the top who can make the differences to actually support cultural change. Now we are getting some movement on um, improvements, but we need to keep pushing because the situations are still occurring. The second thing is about how we support cultural change. Now, if Datex is done correctly with the correct culture around Datexing or formally incident reporting, whatever system you might use in your institution, it can really support a positive cultural change. So if we take it with non-judgment and we look at these instances and we have them formally reported and they're properly investigated, what we can get from them is learning points. What went well in that situation? Actually, on reflection after the incidences, what could I have done? And that helps us build a toolbox of competency to know how to respond in future situations. So if we report them, they're investigated 
and we have opportunities to reflect and then most importantly, share that learning with others. So I can talk about my incident that I had with you today that we used in the case scenario discussion. And I can say, well, actually, when this happened to me, this and this and this is what I did. So then if something similar happens to you, you can think, oh, I remember Simone tried this, let me try this. And you might try it, you might do something even better than me and then share that learning with others. And that's how we build not only our confidence and our competence in reporting these incidences, but it actually will help support cultural change from the bottom. So we're really wanting to support learning and reporting to influence that cultural change and having that data and statistics there as evidence as to why this issue is still very, very relevant and very important. So what we need to think about is um, what should we do? What, what are we saying that should happen if you witness and experience an incident? So again, as we mentioned before, it'd be really, really good if you kind of report this, your supervisor, your manager, and you get that sort of formally documented in your notes or through the Daytech system so we can support that learning experiences. Then sometimes, not in every situation, um, you might find some resistance sometimes. Um, and then it's thinking about what can you do next? Now, in a lot of institutions, um, there are developments of freedom to speak up guardians and BAME ambassadors or other types of ambassadors um, or affinity networks. So I know our, um, in occupational therapy, there's a lot of different affinity networks that people can join, um, such as BAME OT or ABLE. Um, and these might be an opportunity to kind of express how you felt and seek advice from maybe people who aren't directly in your team as to how you can, your options for dealing with the situation that you witnessed or experienced. And then if you kind of weren't as successful, I guess you could then even escalate further into HR or into your unions as well. So we just wanted um, to talk about some of the resources um, that you might want to look into. So as I mentioned before, there's some great um, groups um, that you can join. They've all got great Twitters. So there's BAME OT UK, ABLE OT UK, LGBTQIA OT UK. They've done some great stuff. They really post some really interesting things on Twitter as well. A really good resource for learning and networking as well. Um, locally in your institutions, there might be other affinity groups um, that you can join a bit more locally. I know um, Capital HP, I think there is um, a lot of stuff being done within them, their organization as well. Um, there's often quite a lot of leadership courses um, that people can access. There's ones that are specifically around um, sort of support for managers. These might happen a little bit locally, but I saw, I think there are some that are um, sort of NHS England courses that are being run as well um, that can kind of help build um, your skills as a leader when it comes to these sort of um, issues. And there's obviously lots of local mandatory training um, there's probably a lot of EDI resources and toolkits that are out there, and I'm going to share some resources with you all at the end of this. There's the ARCOT EDB insight sessions and newsletters and, like I said, affinity groups. So lots of resources that are out there, and I know that ARCOT have, have got a great kind of page on their website um, that sort of talks about these types of topics and opportunities. And then if we go to the next one, we just want to, um, we've got just a few more slides. I know it's coming to the end, um, but if you just please bear with us, we won't be too much longer. Um, I do understand if anyone does have to leave promptly, but if you could just fill out the last kind of slide before you go, the code is three, six, one, four, eight, two, five. Um, so we just want to think, like I said, part of this workshop is to take anonymously your comments back to the Royal College of Occupational Therapy to kind of look at what practical resources that could be developed for members. So 
it, if you could ask to our cop for anything on this type of topic, what would be useful to you or to others um, in the future? What kind of resources would you like them to develop? And like I said, this information is going um, directly to ARCOT and we're going to sort of discuss what can be done and hopefully some really good pieces of work will be developed out of this as well. So more training like this. Great. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Thank you. <laughs> um, examples of best practice. I think examples of best practice are really good for supporting cultural change and developing toolkits. So more training videos, people telling their story and perspective posters, leaflets, <coughs> compulsory in service training, training and education, a simple visual image with guidance. I like this, training like this, um, training in local departments across the country. I think difficult conversation training would be really good. It's sometimes like people feel, I want to say something, I'm not really sure how to say it. That would be a really good one, I think. Training from your trust. How, and yeah, ha having those like um, more skills on how to be that sort of authentic ally and how you can kind of engage and talk about these topics, um, even on a positive note. So I agree that. And no worries if you missed some of this, as I mentioned before, this is all recorded, so it will be accessible later on. Um, so keep, um, keep typing in um, your comments. Um, and then we will um, move on to the next poll as well. And just thinking about, we're going to ask two more questions before I just give a little quick um, update about some resources that are available. But just thinking, how confident post session do you now feel in identifying an EDB session? So we just give you guys some time to vote on this one. And then if you just hold on a second, we're then later, we'll move on to the last question, the last poll of the evening. And we'll be asking you guys, <coughs> how confident do you feel in reporting um, an EDB incident? Um, so yes. So role emerging placements, that would be, they are really great. And actually, um, We've got something that has been developed just at the end of our session. So I will um, try and be as quick as I can. I wanted to show you that students at Brunel University have developed a fantastic resource. So as you guys are commenting on that, we might just put on the presentation again. So we might just get that up. So please keep voting. Please let us know how confident you now feel. And um, just very quickly, just thinking about previous sessions that I've run very similar to you guys and um, when people are talking about co-production they're wanting um, some improvements in the environment and um, improvements in the process if we move on to the next slide and um, improvements in emotional support feedback training and tools um, I can sort of share these slides as well so people can sort of look at those options in a little bit more detail but this was a fantastic research um, resource that was brought to my attention so the students at Brunel University um, have developed the 2010 Equality Act and 5Ds of Upstander Interventions by Right to Be um, it's very focused on for students on placement but I feel like um, what they're saying and the steps and the resources they've used could actually be quite applicable to um, staff members or qualified members of staff and um, just in different contexts so they give some really practical tips on how to deal with um, acts of discrimination that might be done to someone against um, by maybe a placement educator if you feel like um, your placement educator is saying something or maybe even your supervisor within your team um, what if service users say something to you? What if you're kind of feeling or experiencing some dim discrimination from your team? And actually um, some really good practical tips on how to go about incident reporting as well. So there's a link there. I might just um, copy and paste that link into the chat just so you can access it. Um, they've lots of great slides, but they've also done like a verbal 
um, kind of video on it. So it's 26 minutes in length in its entirety, but you can just select um, certain topics and it breaks it down and you can listen to them on a more individual basis. So thank you very much students at Brunel. I think this is a really great practical resource that has been developed. So do check it out. Um, so thank you all very, very much for coming tonight and to listening to us and all your sort of fantastic contributions that you've all made. Um, I guess this is at the end in case anyone wants to make any kind of last minute questions or comments, please do so. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Simone. That was insightful, excellent, informative, everything that we had hoped it to be. Um, and also thank you to Amma who has supported Simone with, uh, with this workshop uh, this evening. And of course, thank you all for your participation and sharing your views. Um, we really appreciate this. Um, one more thing, your feedback will be really helpful to us. Um, so it will only take a few moments of your time. So can you please scan the barcode on the screen and that will lead you to a feedback form. Um, additionally, if you have any further comments you would like to add, there is a space for that um, on that form too. So it just leaves me to say thank you again. Thank you, Simone, Amma, um, Chanel, and of course, all uh, wonderful colleagues here and enjoy the rest of the evening. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Yay. you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care.